them up there for me. And we had talked about, actually, I don't know, probably maybe three or four weeks ago, of course, we was out for two weeks, two weeks because of the, of the holiday season. But we, talk, we started a, a, um, a title message called Measurements of Maturity. And the first one we talked about was the strength of character. How many was here? And we talked about the strength of character. And so I just want to do just a quick review today, just a really, really quick review of the few that we have actually actually that we have have talked about but we talked about the the uh, first one being the strength of character and remember we talked about diligence and we went over to second peter 1 10 and we talked about wherefore the the brethren brethren give diligence to your calling and election sure if you do these things you shall never fail and then we talked about character is actually what it is it strengthens us and it enables us to make righteous cho choices actually tough choices and so that was absolutely wonderful and how many remember we talked about on that particular Sunday, we talked about the bags, and so we carried bags, and we say that many times in life, we carry various bags, uh, you know, actually 20, 30 years ago, doesn't matter, but we begin to empty out the bags, and we said that the last bag many times is the, the hardest thing to let go and release, and that's usually the foundation, the thing of everything else that you build upon, and so that was an exciting message, and then we talked about our second one, we talked about settled contentment settle contentment and we said that it's so important that we have contentment we said that what is basically uh biblically uh contentment is defined as the aggressive pursuit of the promises of god from a position of undisturbed internal peace and satisfaction which is the product of having established one's value and worth by their relationship with god and not by the acquisition of things or power. And so today, our third one is we have to have spiritual conviction spiritual conviction. Now, this is anchoring our lives with spiritual principles because we're children of God. We know that we have a scriptural, biblical, and spiritual covenant with God. And then in every situation, we, to, we need to know what God says. We need to know what the word says and trust in it more than the circumstances. And so our first scripture today is, is in Proverbs 3, 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not until thy own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not until thy own understanding. It is so easy many times to lean against your own understanding instead of trusting God. But God says in order for us to be mature, we have to learn to trust him with all our heart and lean not until our understanding. When you really look, about, look around and leave and look in at your, your life and the things that you may be particularly dealing with, you may look at certain things and say, that is really hard to trust God on. I mean, I don't know about you, but have you, are you walking through some things right now that you're looking at those things and you say, God, it is really difficult to trust you in this right here. I can trust you in that, but this right here, I find it very difficult to trust you in. And so God is saying that in order for us to take new territory in life, that we've got to learn to trust him in every Everything that we do, everything that we have, and everything that we don't have. He says that I need you to raise the bar. In other words, I need you to begin to break the glass ceiling that has been hovered over your life. You know, many times in life, we live life under a glass ceiling. And so there are some things that we don't allow ourselves to ascend to. There are barriers. There are limitations. But God says for this year, in order for you to take new territory, in order for you to walk in the maturity that I have designed, for you to walk in I need you to break open the glass ceilings there is limitation there's been barriers there's been hindrances that has held you back but I decree that this year that we shall walk in new territory that we have never walked in before that we will begin to design our life not according to what we see the exterior but we will begin to design our life according to what we see on the inside because what 
you see on the inside is really what matters. That's why the word of God says that you got to renew your mind. Everything starts with your mind. Matter of fact, you don't have success, you know, in your body. You don't have success in your spirit unless you have success in your mind. It all starts with your mind. Matter of fact, just put your hand on your mind and say, mind, be renewed in Jesus' name. Everything starts with the mind. Everything ends with the mind. You know, matter of fact, if you need a promotion, it's going to happen in your mind first. You know, if you need a man or if you need a wife or you need a husband, it's going to happen in your mind first because you got to know how to begin to see yourself. Nothing happens without a renewed mind. No prayer, no fasting, nothing changes unless my mind is renewed. If I can't see it, I can't have it. If I can't perceive a thing, I'll never be able to walk in that thing. If I cannot see it, I cannot grasp it. So in order for me to obtain anything in life, I've got to learn how to renew my mind. That's one of the first things that I've got to learn to do. I've got to learn to think like God thinks. I got to learn how to walk like he walk. I got to learn how to judge the way he judged things. I got to learn how to live like he would have me to live my life. It all starts with my perception. How I see God and how I value his word. If I value his word, then I will apply it to every area of my life. Not a partial not a piece of it, not half of it, not half of obedience, but full obedience. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say spiritual conviction. The fourth maturity comes through our willingness to make sacrificial commitments. Now, sacrifice means to go beyond and above what we had anticipated in the beginning. In order to make a marriage, business, or relationship work, we have to go beyond and above our initial expectation. Those who have successful marriage will say that once they said, I do, it required more than they thought it would in the beginning. Relationships fail when a person is unwilling to make the sacrificial commitment necessary. And then when you really think about it, Everything costs something. Love is not cheap. <laughs> Love will always cost you more than what you're originally willing to pay. You may think that you're going to have to pay this, but when it's all said and done, it will always cost you more than what you originally thought that it was going to cost you. Love is not cheap. Love will make you turn your face and shut your mouth and not say what you really want to say. Love will cause you to forgive even when you don't feel like forgiving. Love is not cheap. Love many times will cost you everything and will almost bankrupt you emotionally because you never felt that you would have to ever give this up and that up. Love is not cheap. Love many times will cause you to confront when you don't want to confront. Love will make you say the confrontational word no, because it's not a word that you're easily acquainted with because you've always been a yes to everybody. But love many times will cause you to say no when you want to say yes. The love of self will cause you to not deal with certain people because you know what they're all about. And you refuse to subject yourself to their craziness and their foolishness. Love many times will cause you to say no more, I can't be your friend because I love myself more than I love you. Love many times will say, I can't be in this relationship because you are actually draining me of everything that I've got. 
And in order for me to succeed in life and to be whole and not end up in prison somewhere, I need to detach myself from you. So I love myself so much that I'm willing not to subject myself to your foolishness. Look at your neighbor and say, love usually costs something. The assignment of Jesus cost him social acceptance. And John 1.1, 1, 1, it says that he came into his own and his own received him not. The assignment of Abraham cost him the comfort of his relatives and home. In Genesis 12, 1, it says, Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. Many times you got to leave family and relatives to get to the place to your assignment that God has called in you too. Love is not cheap. The assignment of Joseph cost him years for slavery, false accusation, and total isolation from his father and family. Esther knew that her assignment would have cost her very life had the king not accepted her. Daniel paid the high cost of enduring the lion's den. The three Hebrew children followed their assignment with total devotion, even through the fiery furnace. We got to realize that sacrifice will always cost you. It is a calculated choice to go beyond your original expectation. It is the extra effort required to succeed. But you also must realize that your sacrifice never go unnoticed by God. It may go unnoticed by man, but it never go unnoticed by God. And then you must realize that God judges your sacrifice independent of what everybody else do. So no matter what somebody else is doing, you can't allow that to dictate to what you do because he's judging you off a different set of rules. You may can't go to the club. You may can't go to the Motel 6. You may can't sleep around because you know what God is calling you to. What they feel they can allow in their life, you know that you cannot allow that in your life. So you never live your life according to somebody else's pattern. You got to live your life according to the pattern that God has given you. Look at your neighbor and say, walk your own walk. Talk your own talk. Be your own person. And then also we must realize and many of us have realized, I'm sure, that have children, we never thought the sacrifice that it would take in raising children. <laughs> when we looked at that beautiful baby, we thought, oh my God, what a wonderful sight he or she is. We didn't realize that there was going to be sacrifices that comes with raising children. The Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom, statue, favor with God, in favor with men. And so in order for me to really be a good parent, I must realize that the first thing that I must give my child is wisdom. That's the first priority for his life. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the application of God's words to daily life. So in other words, I got to fill their ears and minds with the truth of God's words even before they're born into this world because as we know, the world is filled with the devil lies. Studies in child development and psychology have realized that the pattern of a child's life is generally set by age four. This means that whatever a child's learned in the first four years of life will determine the course of the rest of his life, how he thinks, how he feels, how he acts. Everything else is really reinforcement. Everything we know for practical godly living is found in the word of God. So it's so important that we know that we have to make the sacrifice of training our children, that we got to get the book of Psalms in them, the book of Proverbs in them. There are certain things that are in that word of God that solidifies them in their Christian life. Amen. And then the next favor with God. The next thing that we must focus in on parenting is raising our children to receive God's favor. In other words, but in order for them to receive God's favor, they got to know who God is. And then we got to actually give, cause them to have favor with man. That social graces and the basic principles of living responsibility. In other words, you got to teach your children how to get along with people. 
Most people don't know how to get along with people. So you got to learn how to teach your children to get along with people. And it lets them know what I may allow because I love you. Other folks may not allow it. That people many times will cut you off for acting crazy with them. So you got to teach them to get along with people. And the next one that I want to talk about measures, measurements of maturity is there is a sacrilege of compromise. In Isaiah 1, 19, 20, it says, If ye be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, the sacrilege of compromise, what I mean by that is people, when people say, I don't have to do it this way and still get the results. God don't ask for our understanding, but he does ask for our obedience. And we know that when we obey his righteous demand, he has a justifiable right to promote us in life. When we really think about obedience, you really can't actually separate obedience from a prayer life. Obedience is actually giving up one's life in following, following of another, the surrendering of the will to the will of another, the submission of oneself to the authority and the requirements of another. An obedient life helps in prayer. It speeds prayer to the throne. And so I want to show you actually a, uh, actually a uh, what do I have here, an illustration of actually what happens when your prayer life is weak. Holy living promotes holy praying. And the lack of obedience in our lives break down our praying. So what happens is we got some cranberry juice right here. You can go back there a little bit. We have some cranberry juice here. But when my obedience is weak, my prayer life is weak. Now this is a strong, full dosage of cranberry juice. It has not been watered down at all. It is full strength. But what happens is when my disobedience is not full obedience, I begin to actually dilute the effectiveness of my prayer. So what happens is when I walk in unforgiveness, I begin to dilute a little bit. Now you can't tell it completely, but if you can see it really close, you can tell that the water changed a little bit. It didn't change like a whole lot, but it changed just a little bit. And then you got to realize, but when you begin to continue in your disobedience, that your prayer life shall continue to dilute more and more. So what if I am just, you know, I just refuse to to love you, and so, you know, I, I add a little bit more to it. So my prayer has begun to be diluted a, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. And then I can add to it and say, well, you know what? I just refuse to do what the Word says. Matter of fact, I just want to just do what I want to do. I just want to live my life the way I want to live it. I add just a little bit more dilution to it. And the more I am disobedient in the things of God, the more my prayer life is beginning to get diluted more, more, and more. And I begin to wonder, God, why aren't you answering my prayers? I seemingly to be doing everything that you tell me to do. I, I've got all the right steps. I'm, I'm visualizing. I'm meditating on it. I'm doing everything that I know to do, everything that I've been taught, the principles of life. I'm doing exactly everything that I thought that you're telling me to do. But my attitude ain't right. And I began to dilute it just a little bit more. It's beginning to be diluted more and more and more. But what happens is many times we get to a place in life where we say, God, this is just not working. I'm tired. 
How many ever got to a place where you just tired in the area of prayer and you've been laboring and, you know, and you just ain't, ain't, ain't seen nothing happen. And matter of fact, seem like everything is happening for everybody else, but nothing is happening for you. And, you know, and you seem like you at church every Sunday, you tithing and, you know, you're doing everything that you know to do. But that's when that you got to really go on the inside and really begin to look at yourself from the inside out. It's something about just surveying your life. You know how it is many times you just kind of take a glance at something. I mean, you know, you can take a glance at that picture over there and, you know, you say, okay, so that's Dr. Hodge and, you know, and that Mrs. Hodge right there. And you just kind of glance at it. But if you walk just a little bit closer over to the picture, you will begin to, you know, you begin to see my fingernails and, you know, you'll begin to, you know, to see my bracelet and, you know, you begin to see my eyes eyelashes, my false eyelashes that I got on, and you know, you begin to see the color on my lipstick, and you know, you begin to get a little bit closer in on the picture. So what you can see here, you cannot see there because you're not close up. And so it is in your own individual life when you're going through things and things are not happening as fast as they should happen. You got to get a little bit closer to it. You got to evaluate just a little bit more. Now I'm doing this, you know, and I'm doing that, but that's still not, you know, things are still not falling into place. And so that's when you got to like get on your knees and say, God, I need you to show me who I am because I have been living with myself for so long and that I have come up with a picture of who I am but deep down inside there is something that I'm not seeing I mean, have you ever been had to do a puzzle and, you know, and you got all the pieces together and, you know, there was still a few little pieces that was missing and, you know, and you're trying to figure out now where is the missing piece of the puzzle? It's all laid right here before me, but I just can't find it. Where is the missing piece? And that's what you got to do with your own individual life. You got to get down to the nitty gritty of who you really is. You got to go down deep inside of you and begin to explore who you are and what you are on the inside. What makes you tick? What makes you upset? What gets on your last nerve? What makes you want to walk away and slam the door and, you know, and hit somebody and slap somebody? What is the thing that, you know, that causes you to get out of character? Matter of fact, it makes you feel like you're not even saved today. Have you ever walked along the day and, you know, and looked back and, you know, and thought about it, you know, and say, oh, my God, I don't even feel like I'm saved today. And, you know, the things that is coming out of my mouth, now, you know you're saved. You know you're saved. You've been saved for 20 years years. You ain't lost your mind. You know that you're safe, but the way you acting, but the way you're acting just don't really depict who you really are, who you claim you really are, a child of God, spirit-filled, on fire for God, Bible-talking, tongue-talking, devil-casting out. That just don't depict you for that just very moment. And so you got to look back and take a moment and say, okay, God, I'm a little bit out of character. You know, I've been deluded just a little bit. You know, I, you know, things just not lining up the way it should. I need to check myself out and really see what's going on with me. Because what happened is my life has begun to be deluded. My attitude has deluded me. Now, this is still cranberry juice. And if you taste it, it will taste like cranberry juice. But it's weak. <laughs> it's still cranberry juice, but it's weak. It's been diluted. It's not as strong as it originally was made to be. It's weak. It's not going to give me the vitamins that I really, really need because it's diluted. And so it is in our own individual lives. When we got certain weights, we're not as strong as what we was meant to be. We're living a diluted life. We're living a weak life, a watered down life, a defeated life because we have been diluted 
by operating in disobedience. So God says when enough is enough, when you're tired of being tired, when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, how many have ever been sick and tired of being sick and tired? I mean, you know, you, I mean, you, you just at the, uh, at the thousand degree of being sick and tired. You can't be no more sick and tired than what you are. I mean, I'm sick and tired. I've had enough. When you get to the place where you had enough, God says that I will begin to do a new work in you. And that which has been fragmented, that which has been diluted, that which has been just broken down and waterfied, when you become real with yourself, God says, I come real with you. Many times we want God to become real with us, but we're not really ready to be real with ourselves. Matter of fact, we're not really ready for God to be real with us. Because when God surveys your life many times, he may say some things that you really don't want to hear, that you really don't like. You got to be at a place where you say, God, let me have it. Give it to me the way it is. What is it? What do I need to do? And what do I need to change to have a life that's fortified, that's not diluted, that's not watered down? That is operated in full strength, in full capability, in full measure of maturity, that I may walk in my full purpose and be everything that God has called me to be. Well, give her a hand clap. So my question to you today is, what are you going to do? to get your full strength back. For time's sake, I am going to wait and do actually next week, which is our last two, which is called, You Must Understand the Value of Selective Companionship. We're gonna be talking about that next week, so you don't want to miss it. And then I'm also gonna be talking about mature people have a sense of compensation. We're going to be talking about Ruth and Naomi. But at this time, our time is up, ladies and gentlemen. Give the Lord a hand clap, a praise.